Hey, y'all. Thanks for <clears throat> coming to my talk. I will apologize. I am a speaker that's losing his voice, so I sound a little bit like Elmo and Cookie Monster in a fight. Um, I've worked in detection and response for the last decade, and I've made a lot of mistakes, but especially when it comes to metrics. This is the talk I wish I had seen. Today you'll get two things, a new maturity model to help describe and measure detection response capabilities, and a framework to help you build much better metrics. And my story with metrics starts on a Monday morning. I'm only a few months into a new job, and I get a message from my boss, and he says that the board of director meeting is coming up, and he's looking for updated program metrics. And you can tell by my response that I'm new to senior leadership, I don't ask questions, and I'm eager to please. So I send the message to my new team and I ask, hey, what have we presented in the past? And what's the response? That's right. Oh no, bad news, last guy made those up, and good news, I'm gonna do so much better. How many of you have had this happen, where you inherit somebody else's metric mess? This is often our starting point. Metrics that have not been well thought out, and maybe worse, fudge to avoid questions or more work. So I did what you did. I Googled it, and then I ended up just copying the metrics for my last job. And that's led to me using lots of bad metrics. But so what? Why do we care about metrics? Well, one reason might be that metrics help drive improvements. Uh, Carl Pearson is a late 1800s, early 1900s guy and widely viewed as the founder of modern statistics. And he's got this quote that will always come up if you start Googling metrics. That which is measured improves. Which at first sounds like it's just a great plug for metrics. But there's an implied warning in that me message. Uh, what if you're measuring the wrong thing? There's a paper written by these two guys out of MIT, Hauser and Katz, called Metrics, You Are What You Measure. And they talk about how as you pay more attention to metrics, you start to make decisions and take actions to improve those metrics. The metrics you chose are improving. And over time, you'll become what you measure. You'll become what you measure. Metrics also help us communicate what we do and why people should care. Edward Tufte, who, by the way, teaches maybe one of the best courses on presenting data, he says, metrics reveal data. Metrics are a tool that enable us to present the greatest number of ideas in the shortest amount of time with the least ink in the smallest space. And why? Well, let's be honest, because we need a budget and we need headcount, and metrics are usually the tool that we use to communicate that. Metrics help us show our value, and they show a, and de demonstrate a return on investment. But why are security metrics hard? I gave a version of this talk before, and somebody said, because we're trying to prove a negative. And that's partially true, too. In my experience, metrics are hard because I'm a security person, and I don't care that much about metrics. Amen. <laughs> Here's a much less famous quote. Metrics are an annoying PowerPoint I need to update every month. That one's from me. A bit about me. I'm a senior staff engineer at Airbnb. I've lost my voice, and I work on fun things like enterprise security, threat detection, and incident response, and I really love my job. I live in Austin, Texas with my wife and three-year-old son, Liam, who probably got me sick in this throat here. Uh, and I really love being a dad and a husband. And one thing I'm really good at as a husband, as a dad, and as a security engineer is I'm really good at making mistakes. And this is the point of the, the talk where I'm supposed to gain some credibility with all of you, tell you about my 15 years of experience. But in the last 15 years, the reality is that I've just made a lot of mistakes. Let me tell you about three of them. 
And the first terrible mistake I've made is losing sight of the goal. This year marks my 10 year anniversary of being on call. And for those of us that spend our days triaging alerts and responding to fires, it can be really easy to lose sight of the goal. So we end up describing those frontline operations with metrics like this one. Yep. <laughs> and here's a metric that shows the number of security alerts per month. You've seen this metric. You probably have this metric today. And if we take a closer look at this metric, we see in the past year, March and April had the most alerts. My boss will ask me a question about that. And if you keep looking at it, it looks like alerts are generally trending down. Did we do that? Or maybe we just turned off some logging in February. Alert count has become the heartbeat metric for security operations. Instead of rooting back to our goal of detecting threats and responding quickly and effectively, we've reduced ourselves to cries for help. I've come to call this metric the operational burden we've inflicted on ourselves. Another title might be, we're doing things. It's crazy out there. Maybe it's fear driven, scare leadership with a bunch of alerts. And sometimes we try to make it a bit better. We break it down with true and false positives. I've been proud to do this. But really, this only shows how much I've lost sight of the goal. This graph makes a lot of assumptions, like there's a direct correlation between reducing false positives and reducing operational load. And you might be thinking, wait, but doesn't it? This graph also assumes that less false positives means higher quality alert analysis. Or is it the opposite? Do alerts mean you have better visibility in your environment? And because I live in the operations world, I find it's really easy to lose sight of the goal. And I don't even know where to start when I create metrics. So to help you start thinking about your own metrics, I thought about all the different measurable activities in detection and response that can help us make decisions and see if we're improving. And then there's an acronym, so you'll remember it. And the first category of work is streamlined. And this is where our ops metrics live. This is usually focused on efficiency, accuracy, accuracy and automation. Awareness is where we take our threat intel and turn it into our lists of top threats and trends. Vigilance is where we describe our visibility and detection coverage for known threats. Exploration is for the results of our threat hunts and proactive investigations. And readiness is the measurement that shows whether we're prepared for the next big incident. So when you're thinking about your own metrics, think about which saver category the metric would fall under. And this can help you tie it back to your goal or your outcome. And then to figure out what category a metric should fall under, we can ask, what questions does this metric answer? So what question were we trying to answer with this metric? Maybe it was, are false positives taking up too much of our time? Or do we have enough time to investigate our true positives? But how do we control this metric? How do we reduce false positives? Alert tuning? How's that going for y'all? About as good as it is for me. This is a streamlined metric, and streamlined metrics usually answer questions about efficiency, accuracy, and automation. And I have two big problems with this metric. First, this metric doesn't tell me where I'm spending most of my time. And second, the only control I have for this is turning or tuning alerts off. So how can we make it better? So here's a graph of time spent on false positives. And I've completely removed true positives for now because for now I'm saying I'll spend as much time as I need on my true positives. But instead of tracking how many false positives there are, I'm tracking how much time is being spent on them. So how much time you spend working on an alert manually, that could be as simple as measuring the time an alert is assigned to the time that it's marked as a false positive. 
Now, if your team is anything like mine, we have this bad habit where when we're working the alert queue, what do we do? We select all the alerts and then we assign them to ourselves. And why? Why do we do that? What metric makes us do that? Time to assign. Maybe the silliest metric we could have possibly invented. So if we stop measuring it or prioritizing it, this metric suddenly will get a lot more accurate because people won't be as motivated to just go, oh, get my time to assign down, that matters. So how do we control this metric? What can we do to improve this metric? Well, we've been talking about a lot today, automation. And as we get more automation tools, the number of events may not even equate to how much time we're spending on our false positives. And then as you automate, carry the time that you spend manually over to automated. And this lets you do something really cool. This lets you speak to the amount of human hours your automation efforts are saving. And now you're not incentivized to just tune alerts. You're incentivized to find where's the most manual time being spent so that we can move that to automated. Mistake number two thinking proxy metrics are bad. Or, more simply, over-engineering to create this awesome metric with an insane cost when a much less perfect but correlating metric would have been good enough. Here's a great example. Eight years ago, my team and I determined that we wanted to see our MITRE attack coverage so that we could better determine what types of activities we could see and not see. And this was before MITRE attack coverage was like the cool thing to do. So we determined that we'd have to write tests across the entire framework. And once we got going, we figured, well, one test per technique won't tell us much. So we'll need a lot of those. And we've also got Windows and Mac and Linux. So we'll need tests for all of those. And then after years of developing tests and investing in tooling, we finally had the data we needed to visualize our attack detection coverage. Side note, I saw a tweet the other day that said, we need to do a better job of mocking vendors that claim 100% MITRE attack coverage. But many reasons for that. But first being, I've seen the carnage that 100% coverage brings. Hint, it's alert fatigue like you wouldn't believe. Anyway, we spent years gathering all this data. And it's cool, but at the end of the day, all we really wanted to know was, where do we prioritize our detection building? So do this instead. Rather than trying to measure your detection coverage across the entire attack matrix, start by finding your top five threats that you care about the most. Don't overthink it. Look at your external threat intel, think about what type of industry you're in, what type of environment you have, and then look at your incident trends. What types of incidents are reoccurring? and then link those back to your organization's security risks. What would be a really bad day for your company? If data was exfiltrated, what data would make the chief privacy officer just cry the most? And then once you've got your top five, prioritize your detection coverage there. I like to workshop these as a team where we'll take each one of those top threats and then we'll take, break them out into groups and then we'll use attack to derive the different techniques and sub-techniques associated to that threat. And as you write your tests and detections, you will slowly end up building yourself a prioritized MITRE attack coverage map, but without all the alert fatigue and years of building a costly metric. Mistake number three, asking why instead of how. And my natural inclination, inclination is to ask why. Why didn't we detect this malware sooner? Why are we still missing these firewall logs? And as a dad, I have a lot of questions, a lot of why questions. Why did we bring the car seat when we only took one taxi ride the whole trip? Why do we need four suitcases? Why didn't we bring the stroller? Why can't Liam walk by himself? But in all of these examples, why is not helping? So instead, I've learned to move straight to the how. 
and start figuring out what actually needs to be done. And often, answering how allows you to identify the underlying problem much faster and with a much more positive perspective, especially from your spouse, I mean your coworker. How can I carry Liam a car seat and two suitcases through the airport? How can we detect these threats sooner? How can we respond faster? When I interviewed with my current VP, she asked me, how do we build a modern detection and response program? How do we get there? Simple question, not a simple answer. How do we describe where we are today and where we're going? And it made me think about maturity models. And my first exposure to maturity models was the hunting maturity model, HMM. And the hunting maturity model was really helpful in describing the maturity of threat hunting and what we needed to do to get to the next maturity level. Maturity models help us answer these questions. Where are we now? What tools and processes do we have? What's the current situation? What are our challenges? And where are we going? What should the future look like? Where do we want to be in a couple years? How do we get there? What are our objectives? How are we going to achieve them? So I created this threat detection and response maturity model. And the TDR maturity model builds off of the hunting maturity model and expands it across all the different areas of detection and response. And there's a lot to it, but at the end, I'll provide a link that will give you the full maturity model to use. And here are the pillars of it. The first is observability. It's the foundation that we build our detection and response capabilities on. It's having the tools and logs that give us visibility into our entities and user activity. It's enriching it so that we can contextualize that data and search it quickly. The second pillar is proactive threat detection, where we focus on collecting threat intel so we can prioritize the detections that we build and buy and the hunts we perform. And the third is rapid response, where we prepare by having complete playbooks, enrichments, and automations so that we can move from triage to analysis with the forensic capabilities we need to respond as quickly and effectively as possible. And we can use these pillars and these 14 capabilities to describe and measure where we are today and where we want to go next. And the first question we want to ask is, where are we today? So for each capability in the framework, you'll rate the maturity across four different areas. And you'll rate each of them from initial all the way up to leading. And within the framework, there's a lot of specific detail for each type of capability. But here's some general ones for now. And so for example, if we rate our detection engine capability, and we think about the processes we have, do we have a process for creating a detection that, for example, looks for first-time occurrences? Do we have a process that defines how do we determine thresholds? And then we rate our tools. As detection, are our detections centralized and managed from a single location? And then documentation, or what's been the case for most of my career, the lack thereof. And then finally, testing. How do we validate that the logic we're using to determine first-time occurrences, how do we know it's working? And then once you've rated all your capabilities, you can calculate your current state and where you plan to focus on improving. And here's an example of how you could use the model to visualize your current program's maturity. And you can show a comparison of where you plan to be by the end of the year based on the projects and initiatives that you've prioritized. So now, with the maturity model, you have a way to describe where you are and how you're going to get to your target maturity. But as we do work, we'll need metrics to show results. Are we getting better? Are we still on track? Do we need to adjust our strategy? And that's where the Saber framework can come in again. And for each metric you create, you'll put it into this structure here. We want to avoid mistake number one, losing sight of the goal. So what question does this metric answer? What's the outcome we're looking to achieve? And then use the saver categories, streamline awareness, vigilance, exploration, and readiness to help tie us back to our outcome. And then make sure that metric's something we can control today. Think about the levers that control that metric. And then if you have control of a metric, what risks could this measurement reward? 
I was talking to a buddy of mine and we were talking about metrics and he was talking about the time to analyze metric. And it was a really big pain point in the SOC he was working in. Overall analysis was taking a lot longer than they expected. So they brought it up with the team. They said, hey, the time to analyze, it's really high and we need to figure out ways to bring it down. So guess what? You won't believe it. It went down. And then guess what else went down? Quality of analysis. And guess what went up? True positives missed. So when you introduce a new metric, think about the potential risky behavior that could be rewarding. And it might not be a bad metric. You just might want to think about the companion metrics that need to go along with it. Because remember, we are what we measure. And then there's metric expiration. When is this metric no longer needed? When our only lever was alert tuning, it made sense more to track the number of false positives. But now that we have automation tooling, maybe it's less important that we track the number of alert counts or at least remove it from our leadership decks. The next three fields are data requirements, effort, and cost, or simply how much data the metric requires, how much new effort we're going to need to improve that metric, and then how much time does it cost to collect this metric. Remember mistake number two, thinking proxy metrics were bad. Testing 100% across MITRE ATT&CK framework is cool, but you might not need to. And anytime I talk about metrics, I always get asked at the end, so how do I change the bad metrics I'm already presenting today? And I get it, change is hard. Leadership doesn't like surprises and they often have expectations that you'll be updating last month's slide deck. But I have one tip that's worked really well for me. Now here, I've convinced my friend Dexter, and he is still my friend, much to the delight of my toddler here, to get into near freezing water. And when Dexter entered the water, his first reaction was shock. His heart rate spiked, his stress hormone spiked, and when he hit the water, he gasped. And he had to work to not hyperventilate. But then suddenly, clarity. It's the same when you change your metrics. It's not gonna be fun immediately. And some people will go into a state of shock especially when those bad metrics have been around for a while. They've gotten used to them. But my tip is to embrace it. Push through the change, because you too will soon have clarity. So now you have some tools to help you rethink how you measure detection and response. So instead of making wild guesses about whether you're improving, you have the TDR maturity model to measure your capabilities. Instead of using volume counts, fear tactics, and tired emojis, you can use Saver to get to the core of a metric, ask better questions, and map that to something you can control today. And instead of focusing on 100% MITRE ATT&CK coverage, you focus on the threats that matter the most to the business right now and are working on having detection coverage that have real impact. So hopefully this talk is your wake-up call. Take the cold plunge and rethink your detection and response metrics. Thank you. And real quick, here's my link tree. It's got my Twitter and LinkedIn handles, plus there's a copy of the slide deck on there and the complete TDR maturity model. I also write a very infrequent newsletter. Remember, I have a toddler called Meowered. Uh, it has an adorable cat that people love, and the security info is half decent. Um, we're out of time, but I'll be sticking around in the back for a little bit and would be happy to chat. And I have some cute cat stickers, too. Thank you very much.